Paul Lafargue, The Right to Be Lazy, Chapter 1, A Disastrous Dogma, A Strange Delusion Possesses the Working Classes of the Nations Where Capitalist Civilization Holds Its Sway. Delusion drags in its train the individual and social woes which for two centuries have tortured sad humanity. Delusion is the love of work, the furious passion for work, pushed even to the exhaustion of the vital force of the individual and his progeny. Instead of opposing this mental aberration, the priests, the economists and the moralists have cast a sacred halo over work. Than finite men, they have wished to be wiser than their god, weak and contemptible men, they have presumed to rehabilitate what their god had cursed. I, who do not profess to be a Christian, an economist or a moralist, I appeal from their judgment to that of their god, from the preachings of their religious, economics or free thought ethics, to the frightful consequences of work in capitalist society. In capitalist society work is the cause of all intellectual degeneracy, of all organic deformity. Ere the thoroughbred in Rothschild stables, served by a retinue of bipeds, with the heavy brood of the Norman farms which ploughs the earth, carts the manure, hauls the crops. Noble savage whom the missionaries of trade and the traders of religion have not yet corrupted with Christianity, syphilis and the dogma of work, and then look at our miserable slaves of machines. In our civilized Europe, we would find the trace of the native beauty of man, we must go seek it in the nations where economic prejudices have not yet uprooted the hatred of work. Spain, which, alas, is degenerating, may still boast of possessing fewer factories than we have of prisons and barracks, but the artist rejoices in his admiration of the hardy Andalusian, brown as his native chestnuts, straight and flexible as a steel rod and the heart leaps at hearing the beggar, superbly draped in his ragged kippa, parleying on terms of equality with the Duke of Osuna. Spaniard, in whom the primitive animal has not been atrophied, work is the worst sort of slavery. In their era of greatness had only contempt for work, their slaves alone were permitted to labor, the fee-man knew only exercises for the body and mind. So it was in this era that men like Aristotle, Phidias, Aristophanes moved and breathed among the people, it was the time when a handful of heroes at Marathon crushed the hordes of Asia, soon to be subdued by Alexander. Philosophers of antiquity taught contempt for work, the degradation of the free man, the poet sang of idleness, the gift from the gods, omi libid us nobis ecoshefesit. In his sermon on the mount, preached idleness. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jehovah the bearded and angry God gave his Oshipe as the supreme example of ideal laziness. After six days of work, he rests for all eternity. And what are the races for which work is an organic necessity? The the Scotch, those Vaganians of the British Isles, the Galicians, those Vaganians of Spain, the Pomeranians, those Vaganians of Germany, the Chinese, those Vaganians of Asia. The society which are the classes that love work for work's sake. The proprietors, the little shopkeepers, the former bent double over their fields, the latter crouched in their shops, burrow like the mole in his subterranean passage and never stand up to look at nature leisurely. 
Meanwhile, the proletariat, the great class embracing all the producers of civilized nations, the class which in freeing itself will free humanity from servile toil and will make of the human animal a free being. The proletariat, betraying its instincts, despising its historic mission, has let itself be perverted by the dogma of work. Good and terrible has been its punishment. Individual and social woes are born of its passion for work. The two blessings of work in 1770 at London, an anonymous pamphlet appeared under the title, An Essay on Trade and Commerce. In some stir in its time, Buffer, a great philanthropist, was indignant that the factory population of England had taken into its head the fixed idea that in their quality of Englishmen all the individuals composing it have by right of birth the privilege of being freer and more independent than the labourers of any country in Europe. The idea may have its usefulness for soldiers, since it stimulates their valour, but the less the factory workers are imbued with it the better for themselves and the state. The resort never to look on themselves as independent of their superiors. Extremely dangerous to encourage such infatuations in a commercial state like ours where perhaps seven-eighths of the population have little or no property. The war will not be complete until our industrial labourers are contented to work six days for the same sum which they now earn in four. Thus, nearly a century before Geisot, work was openly preached in London as a curb to the noble passions of man. For my people work, the less vices they will have, wrote Napoleon on May 5, 1807, from Oster Road. The authority had be disposed to order that on Sunday after the hour of service be passed, the shops be opened and the labourers return to their work. To root out laziness and curb the sentiments of pride and independence which arise from it, the author of the essay on trade proposed to imprison the poor in ideal workhouses, which would become houses of terror, where they should work 14 hours a day in such fashion that when meal time was deducted there should remain 12 hours of work full and complete 12 hours of work a day, that is the ideal of the philanthropists and moralists of the 18th century. Have we outdone this NEC plus ultra? In factories have become ideal houses of correction in which the toiling masses are imprisoned, in which they are condemned to compulsory work for 12 or 14 hours, not the men only but also women and children. I think that the sons of the heroes of the terror have allowed themselves to be degraded by the religion of work to the point of accepting, since 1848, as a revolutionary conquest, the law limiting factory labor to 12 hours. The claim is a revolutionary principle the right to work. To the French proletariat, slaves would have been capable of such baseness of the heroic times would have required 20 years of capitalist civilization before he could have conceived such vileness. The miseries of compulsory work and the tortures of hunger have descended upon the proletariat more in number than the locusts of the Bible, it is because the proletariat itself invited them. Work which in June 1848 the labourers demanded with arms in their hands, this they have imposed on their families, they have delivered up to the barons of industry their wives and children. In their own hands they have demolished their domestic hearths. In their own hands they have dried up the milk of their wives. Happy women carrying and nursing their babes have been obliged to go into the mines and factories to bend their backs and exhaust their nerves. 
own hands they have broken the life and the vigor of their children. Among the proletarians. Those neighborly housewives told of in our fables and in our old tales, bold and frank of speech, lovers of Bacchus. Those buxom girls, always on the move, always cooking, always singing, always spreading life, engendering life's joy, giving pain knowledge birth to healthy and vigorous children. We have factory girls and women, pale drooping flowers, with impoverished blood, with disordered stomachs, with languid limbs. Have never known the pleasure of a healthful passion, nor would they be capable of telling of it merrily. Children. Twas of work for children. Oh, misery. Dull the Jarl Simon of the Academy of Moral and Political Science, not all the Germanists of Jesuitism could have invented a vice more degrading to the intelligence of the children, more corrupting of their instincts, more destructive of their organism than work in the vitiated atmosphere of the capitalist factory. Epoch has been called the century of work. In fact the century of pain, misery and corruption. A while the philosophers, the bourgeois economists, from the painfully confused Auguste Comte to the ludicrously clear Leroy Biolu, the people of bourgeois literature, from the quackishly romantic Victor Hugo to the artlessly grotesque Paul de Kock, all have intoned nauseating songs in honor of the god progress, the eldest son of not so, they had leisure to taste the joys of earth, to make love and to frolic, to banquet joyously in honor of the jovial god of idleness. England, immersed in Protestantism, was then called, Merry England. Rebelace, Quivedo, Cervantes, and the unknown authors of the romances make our mouths water with their pictures of those monumental feasts with which the men of that time regaled themselves between two battles and two devastations, in which everything, went by the barrel, Jordians and the Flemish school have told the story of these feasts in their delightful pictures. Oh! Where are the sublime gargantuan stomachs of those days, where are the sublime brains encircling all human thought? Indeed grown puny and degenerate. In beef potatoes, doctored wine and Prussian schnapps, judiciously combined with compulsory labor have weakened our bodies and narrowed our minds. At times when man cramps his stomach and the machine enlarges its output to the very times when the economists preach to us the Malthusian theory, the religion of abstinence and the dogma of work. It would be better to pluck out such tongues and throw them to the dogs. As the working class, with its simple good faith, has allowed itself to be thus indoctrinated, because with its native impetuosity it has blindly hurled itself into work and abstinence, the capitalist class has found itself condemned to laziness and forced enjoyment, to unproductiveness and overconsumption. The overwork of the laborer bruises his flesh and tortures his nerves, it is also fertile in griefs for the capitalist abstinence to which the productive class condemns itself obliges the capitalists to devote themselves to the overconsumption of the products turned out so riotously by the laborers. The beginning of capitalist production a century or two ago, the capitalist was a steady man of reasonable and peaceable habits. He entered himself with one wife or thereabouts. Drank only when he was thirsty and ate only when he was hungry. To the lords and ladies of the court the noble virtues of debauchery. 
Every son of the newly rich makes it incumbent upon himself to cultivate the disease for which quicksilver is a specific in order to justify the labors imposed upon the workmen in quicksilver mines. Every capitalist crams himself with cape and stuffed with truffles and with the showiest brands of wine in order to encourage the breeders of blooded poultry and the growers of bordelais. In occupation the organism rapidly becomes shattered, the hair falls out, the gums shrink away from the teeth, the body becomes deformed, the stomach obtrudes abnormally, respiration becomes difficult, the motions become labored, the joints become stiff, the fingers knotted. Too feeble in body to endure the fatigues of debauchery but endowed with the bump of philanthropic discrimination, dry out their brains over political economy, or juridical philosophy in elaborating thick soporific books to employ the leisure hours of compositors and pressmen. Women of fashion live a life of martyrdom, in trying on and showing off the fairy-like toilets which the seamstresses die in making. Lift like shuttles from morning until night from one gun into another. As together they give up their hollow heads to the artists in hair, who at any cost insist on us waging their passion for the construction of false chignons. In their corsets, pinched in their boots, decoll it to make a coal miner blush, they whirl around the whole night through at their charity balls in order to pick up a few cents for poor people, sanctified souls. Fulfill his double social function of non-producer and over-consumer, the capitalist was not only obliged to violate his modest taste, to lose his laborious habits of two centuries ago and to give himself up to unbounded luxury, spicy indigestibles and syphilitic debauches, but also to withdraw from productive labor an enormous mass of men in order to enlist them as his assistants. A few figures to prove how colossal is this waste of productive forces. According to the census of 1861, the population of England and Wales comprised 20,066,244 persons, 9,776,259 male and 10,289,965 female. They deduct those too old of too young to work the unproductive women, boys and girls, then the ideological professions, such as governors, policemen, clergy, magistrates, soldiers, prostitutes, artists, scientists, etc. Next the people exclusively occupied with eating the labor of others under the form of land rent, interest, dividends, etc. Remains a total of 8 million individuals of both sexes and of every age, including the capitalists who function in production, commerce, finance, etc. Out of these 8 millions the figures run, agricultural laborers, including herdsmen, servants and farmers' daughters living at home 1,098,261 factory workers in cotton wool, hemp, linen silk, knitting 642,607 mine workers 565,835 metal workers, blast furnaces, rolling mills, etc., 396,998 domestics 1,208,648, if we add together the textile workers and the miners, we obtain the figures of 2,208,442, if to the former we add the metal workers, we have a total of 1,039,605 persons, that is to say, in each case a number below that of the modern domestic slaves.
Behold the magnificent result of the capitalist exploitation of machines. To this class of domestics, the size of which indicates the stage attained by capitalist civilization, must still be added the enormous class of unfortunates devoted exclusively to satisfying the vain and expensive tastes of the rich dasses, diamond cutters, lace makers, embroiderers, binders of luxurious books, seamstresses employed on expensive gowns, decorators of villas, etc. once settled down into absolute laziness and demoralized by enforced enjoyment, the capitalist class in spite of the injury involved in its new kind of life, adapted itself to it. It began to look upon any change with horror. The miserable conditions of life resignedly accepted by the working class and the sight of the organic degradation engendered by the depraved passion for work increased its aversion for all the compulsory labor and all the restrictions of its pleasures. It's precisely at that time that without taking into account the demoralization which the capitalist class had imposed upon itself as a social duty, the proletarians took it into their heads to inflict work on the capitalists artless as they were, they took seriously the theories of work proclaimed by the economists and moralists and girded up their loins to inflict the practice of these theories upon the capitalists. The Terriot hoisted the ban. He who will not work neither shall he. As in 1831 rose up for bullets or work. The did laborers of March 1871 called their uprising, a revolution of work. Outbreaks of barbarous fury destructive of all capitalist joy and laziness. The capitalists had no other answer than ferocious repression, but they know that if they have been able to repress these revolutionary explosions, they have not drowned in the blood of these gigantic massacres the absurd idea of the proletariat wishing to inflict work upon the idle and reputable classes, and it is to avert this misfortune that they surround themselves with guards, policemen, magistrates and jailers, supported in laborious unproductiveness. No more room for illusion as to the function of modern armies. Permanently maintained only to suppress the enemy within. The forts of Paris and Lyons have not been built to defend the city against the foreigner, but to crush it in case of revolt. An unanswerable example be called for, we mentioned the army of Belgium, that paradise of capitalism. Neutrality is guaranteed by the European powers, and nevertheless its army is one of the strongest in proportion to its population. The various battlefields of the brave Belgian army are the plains of the Borinage and of Charleroi. In the blood of the unarmed miners and laborers that the Belgian officers temper their swords and win their epaulets. Nations of Europe have not national armies but mercenary armies. Protect the capitalists against the popular fury which would condemn them to ten hours of mining or spinning. And, while compressing its own stomach the working class has developed abnormally the stomach of the capitalist class, condemned to overconsumption. For alleviation of its painful labor the capitalist class has withdrawn from the working class a mass of men far superior to those still devoted to useful production and has condemned them in their turn to unproductiveness and overconsumption. A troop of useless mouths in spite of its insatiable veracity, does not suffice to consume all the goods which the laborers, brutalized by the dogma of work, produce like madmen, without wishing to consume them and without even thinking whether people will be found to consume them. 
Content with this double madness of the laborers killing themselves with overproduction and vegetating in abstinence, the great problem of capitalist production is no longer to find producers and to multiply their powers but to discover consumers, excite their appetites and create in them fictitious needs. The European laborers, shivering with cold and hunger, refuse to near the stuffs they weave, to drink the wines from the vineyards they tend. The poor manufacturers in their goodness of heart must run to the ends of the earth to find people to wear the clothes and drink the wines. Europe exports every year goods amounting to billions of dollars to the four corners of the earth, to nations that have no need of them. Explored continents are no longer vast enough. The countries are needed. The manufacturers dream night and day of Africa, of a lake in the Saharan desert, of a railroad to the Saudan. Anxiously follow the progress of Livingston, Stanley, Dukilu, they listen open-mouthed to the marvelous tales of these brave travelers. One wonders are contained in the dark continent. The sown with elephants' teeth, rivers of coconut oil are dotted with gold, millions of backsides, as bare as the faces of Duffo and Juradin, are awaiting cotton goods to teach them decency, and bottles of schnapps and Bibles from which they may learn the virtues of civilization. All to no purpose. The overfed capitalist, the servant class greater in numbers than the productive class, the foreign and barbarous nations, gorged with European goods, nothing, nothing can melt away the mountains of products heaped up higher and more enormous than the pyramids of Egypt. The productiveness of European laborers defies all consumption, all waste. Manufacturers have lost their bearings and know not which way to turn. No longer find the raw material to satisfy the lawless depraved passion of their laborers for work. Woolen districts dirty and half-rotten rags are raveled out to use in making certain cloths sold under the name of Renaissance, which have about the same durability as the promises made to voters. Hands, instead of leaving the silk fiber in its natural simplicity and suppleness, it is loaded down with mineral salts, which while increasing its weight, make it friable and far from durable. Our products are adulterated to aid in their sale and shorten their life. Epoch will be called the Age of Adulteration, just as the first epochs of humanity received the names of the Age of Stone, the Age of Bronze, from the character of their production. Some ignorant people accuse our pious manufacturers of fraud, while in reality the thought which animates them is to furnish work to their laborers, who cannot resign themselves to living with their arms folded. These adulterations, whose sole motive is a humanitarian sentiment, but which bring splendid profits to the manufacturers who practice them. If they are disastrous for the quality of the goods, if they are an inexhaustible source of wasting human labor, nevertheless prove the ingenuous philanthropy of the capitalists, and the horrible perversion of the laborers, who to gratify their vice for work oblige the manufacturers to stifle the cries of their conscience and to violate even the laws of commercial honesty. Nevertheless, in spite of the overproduction of goods, in spite of the adulterations in manufacturing, the laborers encumber the market in countless numbers imploring work. Their abundance ought to compel them to bridle their passion, on the contrary it carries it to the point of paroxysm. Chance for work present itself, thither they rush, then they demand twelve, fourteen hours to glut their appetite for work, 
and the next day they are again thrown out on the pavement with no more food for their vice. A year in all industries lockouts occur with the regularity of the seasons. Look, destructive of the organism is succeeded by absolute rest during two or four months, and when work ceases the pittance ceases. The vice of work is diabolically attached to the heart of the laborers, since its requirements stifle all the other instincts of nature, since the quantity of work required by society is necessarily limited by consumption and by the supply of raw materials, why devour in six months the work of a whole year? Why not distribute it uniformly over the twelve months and force every working man to content himself with six or five hours a day throughout the year instead of getting indigestion from twelve hours during six months? Assured of their daily portion of work, the laborers will no longer be jealous of each other no longer fight to snatch away work from each other's hands and bread from each other's mouths and then, not exhausted in body and mind, they will begin to practice the virtues of laziness. Blized by their vice, the laborers have been unable to rise to the conception of this fact, that to have work for all it is necessary to apportion it like water on a ship in distress. While certain manufacturers in the name of capitalist exploitation have for a long time demanded a legal limitation of the workday. The Commission of 1860 on Professional Education, one of the greatest manufacturers of Alsace, M. Ucart of Geb Wheeler, declared, The day of twelve hours is excessive and ought to be reduced to eleven while work ought to be stopped at two o'clock on Saturday. Vise the adoption of this measure, although it may appear onerous at first sight. I've tried it in our industrial establishments for four years and find ourselves the better for it, while the average production, far from having diminished, has increased. In his study of machines M.F. Parsi quotes the following letter from a great Belgian manufacturer M. Ottivier. Our machines, although the same as those of the English spinning mills, don't produce what they ought to produce or what those same machines would produce in England, although the spinners there work two hours a day less. Work two good hours too much. Convinced that if we worked only 11 hours instead of 13 we should have the same product and we should consequently produce more economically. Again, M. Leroy Biolu affirms that it is a remark of a great Belgian manufacturer that the weeks in which a holiday falls result in a product not less than ordinary weeks. Aristocratic government has dared to do what a people duped in their simplicity by the moralists, never dead. Rising the lofty and moral industrial considerations of the economists, who like the birds of ill men, croaked that to reduce by one hour the work in factories was to decree the ruin of English industry, the government of England has forbidden by a law strictly enforced to work more than ten hours a day and as before England remains the first industrial nation of the world. Experiment tried on so great a scale is on record, the experience of certain intelligent capitalists is on record. But beyond a doubt that to strengthen human production it is necessary to reduce the hours of labor and multiply the paydays and feast days, yet the French nation is not convinced. The miserable reduction of two hours has increased English production by almost one third in ten years, what breathless speed would be given to French production by a legal limitation of the working day to three hours. The laborers understand that by overworking themselves they exhaust their own strength and that of their progeny, 
that they're used up and long before their time come to be incapable of any work at all, that absorb and brutalized by this single vice they are no longer men but pieces of men, that they kill within themselves all beautiful faculties, to leave nothing alive and flourishing except the furious madness for work. Lacadian parrots, they repeat the lesson of the economist. Less work, let us work to increase the national wealth. Oh, idiots, it is because you work too much that the industrial equipment develops slowly. Bring and listen to an economist, no other than M. L. Raybo, whom we were fortunate enough to lose a few months ago. In general by the conditions of handwork that the revolution in methods of labor is regulated. As handwork furnishes its services at a low price, it is lavished, while efforts are made to economize it when its services become more costly. To force the capitalists to improve their machines of wood and iron it is necessary to raise wages and diminish the working hours of the machines of flesh and blood. Do ask for proofs? Furnished by the hundreds. Winning the self-acting mule was invented and applied at Manchester because the spinners refused to work such long hours as before. America the machine is invading all branches of farm production, from the making of butter to the weeding of wheat. Because the American, free and lazy, would prefer a thousand deaths to the bovine life of the French peasant. So painful and so crippling to the laborer in our glorious France, is in the American West an agreeable open-air pastime which he practices in a sitting posture, smoking his pipe nonchalantly. Chatter I V new songs to new music we have seen that by diminishing the hours of labor new mechanical forces will be conquered for social production. Or, by obliging the laborers to consume their products the army of workers will be immensely increased. Capitalist class once relieved from its function of universal consumer will hasten to dismiss its train of soldiers, magistrates, journalists, procurers, which it has withdrawn from useful labor to help it in consuming and wasting. The labor market will overflow. Be required an iron law to put a limit on work be impossible to find employment for that swarm of former unproductives, more numerous than insect parasites, and after them must be considered all those who provide for their needs and their vain and expensive tastes. There are no more lackeys and generals to decorate, no more free and married prostitutes to be covered with laces, no more cannons to bore, no more palaces to build. There will be need of severe laws to compel the working women and working men who have been employed on embroidered laces, iron workings, buildings, to take the hygienic and calisthenic exercises requisite to re-establish their health and improve their race. Once we begin to consume European products at home instead of sending them to the devil, it will be necessary that the sailors, handlers and the draymen sit down and learn to twirl their thumbs. Be Polynesians may then love as they like without fearing the civilized Venus and the sermons of European moralists. As is not all, in order to find work for all the non-producers of our present society, in order to leave room for the industrial equipment to go on developing indefinitely, the working class will be compelled, like the capitalist class, to do violence to its taste for abstinence and to develop indefinitely its consuming capacities. Instead of eating an ounce or two of grisly meat once a day, 
when it eats any, it will eat juicy beef steaks of a pound or two, instead of drinking moderately of bad wine, it will become more orthodox than the Pope and will drink broad and deep bumpers of Bordeaux and Burgundy without commercial baptism and will leave water to the beasts. The Vitarians have taken into their heads to inflict upon the capitalists ten hours of forge and factory, that is their great mistake, because of social antagonisms and civil wars. Ought to be forbidden and not imposed. As childs and other capitalists should be allowed to bring testimony to the fact that throughout their whole lives they have been perfect vagabonds, and if they swear they wish to continue to live as perfect vagabonds in spite of the general mania for work, they should be pensioned and should receive every morning at the city hall a five dollar gold piece for their pocket money. Social discords will vanish. Holders and capitalists will be first to rally to the popular party, once convinced that far from wishing them harm, its purpose is rather to relieve them of the labor of overconsumption and waste, with which they have been overwhelmed since their birth. For the capitalists who are incapable of proving their title to the name of vagabond, they will be allowed to follow their instincts. There are plenty of disgusting occupations in which to place them. Or might be set at cleaning public closets, Goliath might perform surgical operations on diseased horses and hogs. Members of the Amnesty Commission might be sent to the stockyards to pick out the oxen and the sheep to be slaughtered. Dentors might play the part of undertakers and lackeys in funeral processions. And others, occupations could be found for them on a level with their intelligence. Lull and Igli could cork champagne bottles only they would have to be muzzled as a precaution against intoxication. Fresinet and Tyrod might destroy the bugs and vermin in the departments of state and other public houses. It, however, be necessary to put the public funds out of the reach of the capitalists out of due regard for their acquired habits. Patience, hush and prolonged, will be heaped upon the moralists who have perverted nature. But, the counters, the hypocrites, plus and other such sects of men who disguise themselves like maskers to deceive the world. If they give the common people to understand that they are busied about nothing but contemplation and devotion in fastings and maceration of their sensuality, and that only to sustain and aliment the small frailty of their humanity, it is so far otherwise that on the contrary, God knows, what cheer they make, a curious simulant, S.E.D. Bacchanalia Vivant. Read it in great letters, in the colouring of their red snouts, and gulching bellies as big as a ton, unless it be when they perfume themselves with sulphur. It is of great popular rejoicing when instead of swallowing dust as on the 15th of August and 14th of July under capitalism, the communists and collectivists will eat, drink and dance to their heart's content, the members of the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences, the priests with long robes and short, of the economic, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Positivist and Free Thought Church, the propagandists of Malthusianism, and of Christian, altruistic, independent or dependent ethics, clothed in yellow, shall be compelled to hold a candle until it bumps their fingers, shall starve in sight of tables loaded with meats, fruits and flowers and shall agonize with thirst in sight of flowing hogsheads. Times a year with the changing seasons they shall be shut up like the knife grinders dogs in great wheels and condemned to grind wind for ten hours. Mayors and legislators shall suffer the same punishment. A regime of idleness, 
to kill the time, which kills a second by second, there will be shows and theatrical performances always and always. Here we have the very work for our bourgeois legislators. We'll organize them into traveling companies to go to the fairs and villages, giving legislative exhibitions. Girls in riding boots, their breasts brilliantly decorated with medals and crosses, should go through the streets and courts levying recruits among the good people. Better and his comrade Kasagnak shall tend door. Nak in full dualist costume, rolling his eyes and twisting his mustache, spitting out burning too, shall threaten everyone with his father's pistol and sink into a hole as soon as they show him Lulia's portrait. Better will discourse on foreign politics and on little Gris who makes a doctor of him and would set Europe on fire to pill for Turkey, on great Russia that stultifies him with the mincemeat she promises to make of Prussia and who would fain see mischief brewing in the west of Europe so as to feather her nest in the east and to strangle nihilism at home, on Mr. Bismarck who was good enough to allow him to pronounce himself on the amnesty. The covering his mountainous belly smeared over with red and white and blue, the three national colours, he will beat the tattoo on it, and enumerate the delicate little ortolans, the truffles and the glasses of margors and wycombe that it has gulped down to encourage agriculture, and to keep his electors of belevelling good spirits. Erex the entertainment will open with the plus electoral farce in the presence of the voters with wooden heads and asses ears, the bourgeois candidates, dressed as clowns, will dance the dance of political liberties, wiping themselves fore and aft with their freely promising electoral programs, and talking with tears in their eyes of the miseries of the people and with copper in their voices of the glories of France. The heads of the voters will bray solidly in chorus, hi hum. Start the great play, The Theft of the Nation's Goods. List France, an enormous female, hairy-faced and bald-headed, fat, flabby, puffy and pale, with sunken eyes, sleepy and yawning, is stretching herself out on a velvet couch. Feet industrial capitalism, a gigantic organism of iron, with an ape-like mask, is mechanically devouring men, women and children, whose thrilling and heart-trending cries fill the air, the bank with a martin's muzzle, a hyena's body and harpy hands, is nimbly flipping coins out of his pocket. Hs of miserable, emaciated proletarians in rags, escorted by gendarmes with drawn sabers, pursued by furies lashing them with whips of hunger, are bringing to the feet of capitalist France heaps of merchandise, casks of wine, sacks of gold and wheat. Oh is his never garment in one hand, the testament of Proudhon in the other and the book of the national budget between his teeth is encamped at the head of the defenders of national property and is mounting guard. Laborers, beaten with gun stocks and pricked with bayonets, have laid down their burdens, they are driven away and the door is open to the manufacturers, merchants and bankers. Themselves pelmel upon the heap devouring cotton goods, sacks of wheat, ingots of gold, emptying casks of wine. have devoured all they can, they sink down, filthy and disgusting objects in their ordure and vomitings. The thunder bursts forth, the earth shakes and opens, historic destiny arises, with her iron foot she crushes the heads of the capitalists, hiccuping, staggering, falling, unable to flee. Broad hand she overthrows capitalist France, astounded and sweating with fear. 
it uprooting from its heart the vice which dominates it and degrades its nature, the working class were to arise in its terrible strength, not to demand the rights of man, which are but the rights of capitalist exploitation, not to demand the right to work which is but the right to misery, but to forge a brazen law forbidding any man to work more than three hours a day, the earth, the old earth, trembling with joy would feel a new universe leaping within her. But should we ask a proletariat corrupted by capitalist ethics to take a manly resolution? Christ, the doleful personification of ancient slavery, the men, the women and the children of the proletariat have been climbing painfully for a century up the hard calvary of pain, for a century compulsory toil has broken their bones, bruised their flesh, tortured their nerves, for a century hunger has torn their entrails and their brains. Zlazianis, have pity on our long misery. Zlazianis, mother of the arts and noble virtues, be thou the balm of human anguish. Aksar moralists are very modest people. They invented the dogma of work, they still have doubts of its efficacy in tranquilizing the soul, rejoicing the spirit, and maintaining the proper functioning of the entrails and other organs. I wish to try its workings on the populace, in a Naim Kavili, before turning it against the capitalists, to excuse and authorize whose vices is their peculiar mission. But for ascent philosophers, why thus cudgel your brains to work out an ethics the practice of which you dare not counsel to your masters? Of work, of which you are so proud, do you wish to see it scoffed at dishonored? Open the history of ancient peoples and the writings of their philosophers and lawgivers. Not affirm, says the father of history, Herodotus, whether the Greeks derived from the Egyptians the contempt which they have for work, because I find the same contempt established among the Thracians, the Scythians, the Persians, the Lydians, in a word, because among most barbarians, those who learn mechanical arts and even their children are regarded as the meanest of their citizens. Greeks have been nurtured in this principle, particularly the Lacedaemonians. At Athens the citizens were veritable nobles who had to concern themselves but with the defense and the administration of the community, like the savage warriors from whom they descended. They must thus have all their time free to watch over the interests of the Republic with their mental and bodily strength. They laid all labor upon the slaves. Lies at Lacedaemon, even the women were not allowed to spin or weave that they might not detract from their nobility. The Romans recognized but two noble and free professions, agriculture and arms. All citizens by right lived at the expense of the treasury without being constrained to provide for their living by any of the sordid arts. Thus, they designated the trades, which rightfully belonged to slaves. The brooches to arouse the people, accused Tarquin, the tyrant, of the special outrage of having converted free citizens into artisans and misons. Ancient philosophers had their disputes upon the origin of ideas but they agreed when it came to the abhorrence of work. No says Plato in his social utopia, his model republic, nature has made no shoemaker nor smith. Scupations degrade the people who exercise them. The mercenaries, nameless wretches, who are by their very condition excluded from political rights. A merchants accustomed to lying and deceiving, they will be allowed in the city only as a necessary evil. 
Dizan who shall have degraded himself by the commerce of the shop shall be prosecuted for this offence. If convicted, he shall be condemned to a year in prison, the punishment shall be doubled for each repeated offence. In his economics, Dizan often writes, the people who give themselves up to manual labor are never promoted to public offices, and with good reason. It a part of them, condemned to be seated the whole day long, some even to endure the heat of the fire continually, cannot fail to be changed in body, and it is almost inevitable that the mind be affected. What honorable thing can come out of a shop? asks Chichiro. Commerce produce in the way of honor? In called shop is unworthy an honorable man. Hence can gain no profit without lying, and what is more shameful than falsehood? And, we must regard as something base and vile the trade of those who sell their toil and industry. For whoever gives his labor for money sells himself and puts himself in the tank of slaves. Proletarians, brutalized by the dogma of work, listen to the voice of these philosophers, which has been concealed from you with jealous care, a citizen who gives his labor for money degrades himself to the rank of slaves, he commits a crime which deserves years of imprisonment. In hypocrisy and capitalist utilitarianism had not perverted these philosophers of the ancient republics. In for free men, they expressed their thought naively. Oh, Aristotle, those intellectual giants, beside whom our latter-day philosophers are but pygmies, wish the citizens of their ideal republics to live in the most complete leisure. For as Xin often observed, work takes all the time and with it one has no leisure for the Republic and his friends. According to Plutarch, the great claim of Lycurgus, wisest of men, to the admiration of posterity, was that he had granted leisure to the citizens of Sparta by forbidding to them any trade whatever. Moralists of Christianity and capitalism will answer. These thinkers and philosophers praised the institution of slavery. Perfectly true, but could it have been otherwise, granted the economic and political conditions of their epoch? It was the normal state of ancient societies. The man was obliged to devote his time to discussing the affairs of state and watching over its defense. Deeds were then too primitive and clumsy for those practicing them to exercise their birthright of soldier and citizen, thus the philosophers and lawgivers, if they wished to have warriors and citizens in their heroic republics, were obliged to tolerate slaves. Do not the moralists and economists of capitalism praise wage labor, the modern slavery, and to what men does the capitalist slavery give leisure? People like Rothschild, Schneider, and Madame Bossicourt, useless and harmful slaves of their vices and of their domestic servants. The of slavery dominated the minds of Pythagoras and Aristotle. This has been written disdainfully, and yet Aristotle foresaw that if every tool could by itself execute its proper function, as the masterpieces of Daedalus moved themselves or as the tripods of Vulcan set themselves spontaneously at their sacred work, if for example the shuttles of the weavers did their own weaving, the foreman of the workshop would have no more need of helpers, nor the master of slaves. Aristotle's dream is our reality. Machines, with breath of fire, with limbs of unwearying steel, with fruitfulness, wonderful and inexhaustible, accomplish by themselves with docility their sacred labor. 
Nevertheless, the genius of the great philosophers of capitalism remains dominated by the prejudice of the wage system, worst of slaveries. Do not yet understand that the machine is the savior of humanity, the god who shall redeem man from the sordid artes and from working for hire, the god who shall give him leisure and liberty.